Welcome to the Australian Water School, the home of demand-driven industry design training for the global water sector. Hello to everyone attending our webinar today on the PMF. I am your host, Cray Price with Surface Water Solutions. We are going to uh, be in for quite a treat today. We've got some expert presenters on board today to help walk us through some of the most common questions around the PMF, the probable maximum flood. And even though we have PMF in the title, we are going to give equal time to the PMP, the probable maximum precipitation. We were thrilled to have a look at the numbers and see that we had almost, uh, actually, I think we've passed a thousand registrants for this webinar. So thanks for signing up for this. It gives us an idea of how relevant this topic is to the industry. And so thank you for uh, being here from around the world. And we do hope you get some valuable material out of this webinar. And also welcome to those at attending through the recording later on on our YouTube channel. This will be up for everyone to watch uh, later on. What we've got today then for our presenters, Rory Nathan and Daryl Lamb. Um, I know when I first moved to Australia, 12 years ago, I went to a conference, I think it was in Adelaide, 46 degrees, uh, that's centigrade for uh, those in the US. Um, and it was Christmas time, there was a parade outside, Santa suit and everything. And I thought, wow, this is a strange place. But I was really starting from scratch again in a new field, new place. And I went around and was asking people, hey, who do I talk to? I, I, I understand hydraulics, um, that's going to work pretty much the same way, slopes are slopes and rock is rock. But um, as far as how much rainfall accumulates and where it rains and when it rains and how that turns into runoff, that's a local art. And I wanted to know who who out there do I need to talk to? And when I asked that question, who's who, um, Rory Nathan's name came up. And I think I just handed him a quick business card and said, hi, I'm new here. And, uh, you know, but um, I've uh, always followed his research very closely um, because he's been coming highly recommended. Likewise, Daryl uh, is someone who I've been citing his papers for many years um, before I'd actually met him. And uh, we're excited to have Daryl on with us as well. So uh, maybe just over to you guys. Um, tell us where you're coming to us from and how you're surviving lockdown. And uh, maybe uh, if, if you are following the footy, um, that's one thing we're worried about out here in WA where we're kind of safe in quarantine out here um, is the influx now when we got the footy finals. If, uh, if that's something that you wanted to comment on, are you upset that they've taken that away from, uh, I guess, your home state there, Rory, first, and then over to you, Daryl? Well, yeah, no, look, I'm uh, actually a Melbourne supporter uh, when I do support, and I have to say I've been waiting, what is it, 46 years for them to actually be in the final. This is the first time in a long time that they've got a chance and to think that it'll be in, the, in, the, in a different city. <laughs> Instead uh, of the MCG. Oh, boy. <laughs> That's but, a tough uh, look, you yeah, know, we're, we're, I think we've passed our sort of 220th day in lockdown in Melbourne and wow. just looking at all the countries you're from in the audience, I'd have to say there's a lot of places I'd rather be at the moment. So <laughs> hope you all enjoy the day. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, over to you, Daryl. Um, you, you're surviving so far there and uh, you're up in Brisbane. Yeah, that's right. Um, can't, can't compare to the other parts um, of Australia. We're pretty, pretty lucky up here in Brisbane. Haven't had um, too much of a lockdown, so um, yeah, hopefully it stays that way. <laughs> Great. Well, we'll look forward to hearing from Daryl momentarily. In the background, we've also got Ben Tate answering your questions on the Q&A line uh, from Water Technology. Roy's going to just really take us through an assessment of the PMF. What does it mean? Where does the PMP come from? And then Daryl's going to specifically talk about, is this reality? Where, does the PMF ever happen? Where are, you know, with these envelope curves, curves that you can generate, um, where do we sit relative to those curves? I'll present a few examples of mining projects um, and whether we should be designing those for the PMF, and then we'll open it up to questions in the end. So with that, um, we'll turn straight over to Rory. I can see your screen just fine. So I'm going to duck out and we'll answer your questions uh, on the Q&A line in the background and look forward to coming back on during the Q&A session. Thanks. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Craig. And again, welcome to everybody. It's a fantastic collection of countries you're all in. Um, so look forward to seeing what questions you have. So it's a bit hard. Um, it's a, I saw those, that range of experiences and context you're from. So this will be kind of a quite a helicopter view uh, of the topic, um, but we'll see, hopefully I'll be able to answer some of the questions. So first of all, why are we, why are we worried about PMS? Well, probable maximum events, they're commonly used around the world as a kind of a design standard, particularly for infrastructure that pose a, a threat to life. So most commonly in dams, 
and in places where there are nuclear power plants, these are also um, kind of a design standard uh, in terms of inundation risk. Now, the concept is, you know, these are treated as a physical upper limit, and therefore it's kind of assumed that uh, is, if we've designed to this upper limit, then that will never be exceeded, and therefore that infrastructure will forever be safe. But unfortunately, we've actually got a lot of evidence to demonstrate that these maximum possible events do appear to have increased over time, and this is really is a function of, of the methods we're using to estimate it. So as more data becomes available, these estimates are going to get larger. And uh, we've also, and I'll explain why from a theoretical point of view, we do expect um, to see uh, cases where these events are exceeded in practice. Um, the other problem with the PMF, as I'll explain in the next slide, is they're actually how you derive them uh, can involve a fair bit of subjectivity, and it's clear that different practitioners, given the same input information, will come up with different size floods. And uh, there are also good theoretical reasons and uh, operational reasons um, why these estimates vary uh, with region or jurisdictional boundary, location, catchment area, and, and event duration. So I'll try and touch on some of the reasoning behind this as, as I go through. It's worth saying too, I'm going to be going through some of the um, concepts that go behind uh, the PMF in terms of the decisions that you as practitioners will be making. Fair to say these are of, of I think, central importance if you're using uh, PMF as a design standard. I think if you're interested, in, and I saw that in, in, in the list there, there's quite a few of you interested in, in emergency preparedness. Um, I do feel for emergency preparedness or for if you're just trying to get at some notional sense of an upper bound for floodplain planning or regulation purposes, do feel the issues you need to consider are a lot more straightforward and a lot simpler. I don't feel some of the complexities that I'll be talking about are, are going to be that relevant to it, but there's some common assumptions that you do need to explicitly consider in design that you don't necessarily have to consider for, for warning purposes, for instance. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of key concepts. I'll start with the probable maximum precipitation, PMP. Defined, this is a WMO definition. It's the greatest depth of precipitation for a given duration that is physically possible for a given area in a given location at a given time of year. So that is, this definition is very much uh, trying to uh, reinforce the point that this is, this is an upper limiting, this is in fact a physical upper limit. The PMF is a slightly different definition, and this does vary differently around the world. I'm, I'm using a definition that we use here in Australia, um, but there's a lot of commonality in these definitions. And here it's defined as the limiting value of flood that could reasonably be expected to occur. And I'll come back to this point reasonably in a moment. It's a key one. And the point about the PMF or the PMP, both of them only refer to this sort of notional limit or upper limiting value on the event magnitude. Neither of these in, in any of the practice define well how likely is it that they're exceeded. And in the PMF, particularly um, superposing risks of very low probabilities is, is not appropriate, but we do need some degree of conservatism. So I'm going to drill down on, on that bullet point in, in a couple of slides time. Now, in, a, in the Australian guidelines for flood estimation also define something called the PMP flood, used to be called the PMP design flood. And this has a much kind of clearer design objective. Um, and it's, it's, it's the flood that you derive from the PMP, but you choose the assumptions that you choose to convert that uh, PMP to a flood uh, are what they call probability neutral. So really what we're trying to say is the PMP flood has the same exceedance probability as the PMP. And by definition, therefore, the PMP flood is uh, always going to be um, a smaller than uh, the PMF. A lot of the detail I'm talking about um, is, uh, is available if you want to look into that in a, so in a, in a book uh, under that URL link. Okay, the general approach of estimating the PMF is actually uh, extremely simple. You start with a model. It's the same kind of model you, you, you would use for, for any flood estimation process. And you then, the top left up here, you input, uh, you find, well, what is the average depth of rainfall for a range of durations that are critical to uh, your design? You make some assumption around losses. And in Australia, we typically assume that there's zero initial loss or about a millimetre hour continuing loss, but you can vary that. 
you've got to make a choice about how that PMP is distributed in time. Um, and in many countries, you just get a single pattern. Uh, in Australia, uh, you get an ensemble of patterns, and I'll um, briefly talk about the influence of that. And you also have got to make some uh, decision around how that um, this, that spatial pattern um, is actually orientated over the catchment and generally the advice around the world is you try and centre it and rotate it so you maximise the size of the flood. But all these, are, these inputs are kind of specialist um, inputs relevant to PMP uh, events. The model itself is uh, the same kind of model you'd use for, um, for normal flood estimation. And you put those inputs into your model and lo and behold, you then get a nice hydrograph out of it, and we call that hydrograph the PMF. I'll make the point that um, when we derive these PMFs, we're always trying to kind of ground the estimate in reality in some way. The first bit of reality I always, I always look at is how big are the observed floods in that catchment or indeed in that region? And what we'll generally find is that these observed floods are actually very small, um, 10 or 20 times smaller than the flood we're estimating. So we really need to keep front of mind, we are making, as soon as we extrapolate um, observed response uh, to this extent, we really need to be pretty thoughtful about the assumptions we use to, to make that extrapolation. And that's where I think all the difficulty and challenge in PMFs come. So the key question in this, I'll come back to the, this is the PMF de definition, where we're identifying the identifying the limiting value of flood that could reasonably be expected to occur, we kind of need to balance two things here. One of them is we want to keep it conservatively high because it is something towards, you know, an upper limiting value, but we want to avoid um, combining too many factors with very low likelihoods because um, you can shift the severity or the magnitude of a PMF by quite a lot by um, assuming more and more conservative factors, and I'll demonstrate that in a moment. So the question is, what is this word reasonable? How do we, how do we achieve this, this balance? And to me, this is the, the key concept that if we're designing critical infrastructure, we need, to get a, we, we need to get a handle on how we balance conservatism with what's physically possible. So I've got a little, um, little graphic I want to run through now. And all of these plots I'm about to show you, they're all, on the, they're all derived with the same depth of rainfall. So we've got the same depth of rainfall, and for this simulation, I'm demonstrating an example where we're looking at outflow floods from a dam. And so, therefore, the, the kinds of things you, you commonly need to think about, the assumptions you're making when you convert a PMP to a PMF, is losses in the catchment, how that rainfall is distributed in time, how it's distributed in space, how much airspace was in the reservoir uh, before the inflow, the PM, PMF inflow came into it, were there any events prior to that uh, uh, PMP occurring? And in fact, could this reservoir in fact be surcharged uh, prior to, to that event occurring? And in many countries of the world, you also need to be thinking about uh, initial snowpack conditions and, and rain on snow uh, as, a, as a driver. Now, what I want to do is show that um, let's assume uh, that um, I've derived, um, I've put my PMP into my flood model and I've been very careful about my, um, my assumptions and I'm pretty, pretty comfortable, and there are ways of doing this, but we'll skip that for the moment. I'm pretty comfortable that the, the PMP, the flood I'm getting out of this um, under probability neutral assumptions is somewhere in this range. So what I'm just showing here, this bottom axis, is the uh, magnitude of the PMP. And you can see it's going from naught down here, and that's I've binned, binned all these different categories out to about, what is it, 2,000, 2,100 uh, cubic metres per second. And under probability neutral assumptions, I've, um, I've determined uh, that the flood coming from a PMP is around somewhere in the 800. And in fact, there's a little hydrograph there of what that flood looks like. So here's uh, what I'm calling the PMP flood. Now, when we now take our PMP and our flood model and we now make decisions about these other assumptions, we've now we've got these, um, uh, we're going to make decisions about this. And what I'd like to do now is actually just randomly sample from a realistic range of initial and continuing losses 
a realistic range of how the PMP might be varied in time. And I'm just considering here uh, the initial water level in the reservoir uh, and not considering these other things at the moment. And I've just um, I've made some random sample from, uh, from those three. And you can see in this particular case, I've just produced a hydrograph that is in fact a fair bit smaller than my PMP flood. And I've just kept track of where that flood occurs. And it's somewhere, what is it, around 200 cumex, and therefore it lands in this bin here. Now, if I swim, spin the roulette wheel again, I'll take another random sample of, uh, of losses, temporal pattern, initial water level. I've now got two samples. And you can, and you can see the second sample, uh, I've now got a flood that is actually very close to what I calculated as being the PMP flood. And there's that little hydrograph there. Do another sample. This one's a bit smaller falling in this bin. So I can now just keep sampling all these inputs in a way um, where these inputs are, are consistent with the likelihood that they'll occur in nature prior to the PMP occurring. So you can see if I've now sampled this 15 times, I've now got uh, a flood here that's somewhere in that 16 to 1700 cumic range. Um, I've got that seems to be equally likely or occurred equally as frequently as one in a thousand cumic range and one in the middle here, one at, uh, a bit lower. And there's a bunch of, bunch of other ones down here. And let's just keep cycling through. So I've now done this 30 times, 40 times, 50 times, 100 times. We're now starting, starting to see a bit more of a distribution appearing here. But look at the range of hydrographs we're getting. So you can see some of those hydrographs are really kind of small and flat and longer, and some are very short and peak earlier um, and recede uh, earlier. But in terms of looking just the peaks, they're falling into these bins. So that's 100, 100 samples, 200 samples, 500 samples, 1,000 samples, 2,000 samples, 5,000 samples, 10,000 samples. We could keep going. But uh, I can tell you um, that this is the kind of very typical distributions we get when we um, run a model with a, with a fixed PMP. And you can see it's slightly skewed, um, but that the range really is varying somewhere between you know, below 100 out to um, 2,000. It's an extraordinary range. So the question is, all those inputs are possible. What we've got to say is, well, if we're estimating the PMF, how do we balance that sense of the need for a bit of conservatism but without being too unrealistic? Do we want to choose something that's way out here that's the... Is this the, the most extreme flood that you'd get out of 10,000 different combinations of inputs, or do we want something more centrally tended? Well, one possibility um, is you may want to de define the PMF as something uh, that if the PMP occurs, uh, then the PMF could be something with a 10% chance of exceedance. So you could do 100 runs, uh, sampling these things randomly, and then pick one something that's the, in the top 10. So that's reasonable, but... Um, that's something a decision maker could be involved in. It's not necessarily a hydrological decision. And having made that decision, we'll say, okay, well, in this, in this instance, the PMF is about uh, 1.8 times bigger than the flood derived under probability neutral assumptions. So if we look at this in the frequency domain, um, here's our frequency curve. Um, and there's our, PM, there, there's our PMP flood with the same AP of the PMP. There's our PMF. It's a bit rare and a bit bigger. And if we take that information I just showed you from all those simulations, we can actually then plot that on a frequency curve. And um, that then um, and makes sure or is a way of ensuring that our PMF has some kind of grounded in some way in, uh, in the frequency estimates that we may derive by other means. So one of the things we want to know is we've got to anchor that PMP flood at this AP than PMP. So how do we determine the AP to PMP? Because remember, the definition of the PMP is the greatest depth that is physically possible. So how, you might ask, well, how on earth can we estimate how on earth can the PMP exceeded, be exceeded if it's the maximum possible? Well, what we need to do here is to differentiate between the theoretical definition of the PMP and our operational ability to actually estimate it. And what is very clear is that that when we estimate the PMP, we have to make some assumptions and the, about what method we use and what data sets we use. And in the 60s, we were doing a lot of in situ maximization method and we we're getting PMP sort of of this magnitude, for instance. A decade or so later, we changed methods and started using more of a limited transposition technique. And therefore, there was a lot, we ended up using a larger number of local and nearby gauges. 
um, and the PMPs tended to be bigger. So we had to go back and redesign spill, a lot of spillways on dams. And then we started using, coming up with estimates of PMPs using more generalised regional transposition techniques, and here we're using many more regional gauges, and again our PMP methods went up, our PMP estimates went up. So while this caused a lot of headache for people owning infrastructure, if you look at this from a risk-based perspective, um, all these points lie on the same frequency curve. The only thing that varies is the fact that these in situ maximisation have a much more likely chance of occurring than an estimate from one of the other methods. So therefore, while the PMP is a concept can't be exceeded, our ability to estimate it definitely can be exceeded and is a function of both methods and data sets. So the AEP is in fact of the PMP, you can actually calculate this, it's a product of two probabilities. First of all, there's the probability, or what's the likelihood, and this is in Australia, this is a northern tropical region here, what's the likelihood that a PMP, of, a PMP event could occur anywhere in that, in that uh, homogeneous region? That's one probability. And then there's the conditional probability that given that that event has actually landed somewhere in that transposition zone, what's the probability that it lands on my catchment of interest? So you can think of that as, an up, as a dartboard that in fact, the larger the dartboard, i.e. the larger the catchment we're looking at, the, the more likely it is we're going to hit it. So what we'll find then is, this is from an, uh, uh, book eight, what we'll find then is that the AEP, the PMP, actually increases um, as the catchment area gets bigger, i.e. the bigger the catchment, the more likely it is that a, uh, that a PMP will land on it. But I also want to make the point, it's these concepts that explain why, in fact, we should be seeing the occasional PMP or the occasional PMF in, in the observed record. Um, because the likelihood that it occurs, a PMP might occur somewhere in that region is a lot higher than the likelihood that it occurs exactly on my catchment of interest. And this is kind of the same thing as, a, as a, you know, the chance of being hit by a meteor. The, the chance that a tiny meteor will land somewhere in, somewhere in Australia is actually much greater than, the, the, than the, the likelihood that that particular tiny meteor lands on me where I'm speaking at the moment. So it's those two combinations means that we should see occasional very extreme events in the observed record. They just may not. The likelihood of it occurring on your particular point of interest is actually pretty remote. Um, in the time available, I'm just going to briefly mention, because uh, it, uh, it, it does come up a lot, the impact of climate change. Impact of climate change, it, yes, it does impact on the amount of water availability in the atmosphere. Um, the drying soils will also mean that losses might even be even lower, but um, the airspace in reservoirs is also likely to increase because of increased demands. Um, we've also got evidence that storm temporal and spatial patterns may intensify. So while we've got evidence around this, we also know, however, that these influences do vary with event duration, event severity, and it's, it is actually quite unclear as to how these impact on PV methods and PMS. Um, and I draw you to there's a, a review recently done by Sava Sadal in uh, the AC Journal of Hydrologic Engineering and, uh, and uh, Conrad Wesco and, and some co-authors also produced a couple of papers on this as well. So just some final points so I can stop. Um, Careful consideration does need to be given to the reasonableness of assumptions used to derive the PMF, especially when designing critical infrastructure. There's uh, go to that uh, ANR. There's a whole book on, on this if you want the details. Um, but if the PMF is only required as a check, as an upper limiting magnitude, floodplain planning, emergency preparedness, I think a lot of the issues I was talking about, while I still relate, um, they're not going to be as important for those purposes. So the effort, the, the things you need to think about to derive a PMF are really much, much, much more straightforward for those kinds of applications. If required for risk assessments, uh, I think you save a lot of problems by focusing on the PMP flood um, rather than the PMF. Uh, and then if the estimates increase over time in the future, as they indefinitely will, um, the risk estimates may not. And the AEP of the PMP is heavily dependent upon on both the method used to derive it and the data. And, and it is quite appropriate uh, and, and theoretic and possible to actually estimate an AEP of the PMP. Thank you.
Great, thanks, Rory. Um, while Daryl's uh, sharing his screen, um, go ahead and have a look now at the number of questions coming in. Uh, Daryl has been answering a few in the background and thanks, Ben, uh, for answering those. We will provide you with a list of additional resources and there are courses on these topics coming up for those who want uh, more than we can uh, pack into this one hour time period. So keep those questions coming um, over to you, Daryl. I can see your screen just fine, thanks. Thanks, Craig. Um, thanks, everybody. I'm Daryl, and thanks to Rory for the very interesting talk on PMF. I'm sure now we know a lot more. Right, now that we know a bit better about PMF, let's, let's take a look at um, flood envelope curves and um, paleo flood records and see where they sit um, in relation to the PMFs. So, um, flood envelope curves. Typically, what you see here in this figure, you have... Um, as the name suggests, a curve or a line that envelopes uh, maximum gauge observed floods. So um, typically in a log log plot, you have drainage area on the x-axis and peak discharge on the y-axis. Um, it gives us a quick understanding of a uh, quick reference guide to what uh, maximum likely flood magnitude you, you can expect in a particular point of interest or location of interest. Um, what I really like about um, a flood envelope curve is the fact that um, you really only need one variable, which is um, the contributing catchment area size to give you a rough idea of um, what kind of flood magnitude you can expect to see. Um, this figure here is slightly different from the previous one. Um, the only difference here is the y-axis is uh, instead of peak discharge, is specific discharge, which is um, discharge per unit area. So that, there are many different kinds of um, envelope curves or different spatial extent or spatial representation that you can use um, to produce envelope curves. A uh, bit of shameless um, self-promotion here. The, the one you see on the left is um, the Australian envelope curve that I developed um, back in 2016 um, using about 2,669 uh, maximum gauge records across the whole of Australia, develop the envelope curve. Uh, you can also have envelope curve if you look at the one on the top right hand corner um, for any region. This is an example from um, South India and Deccan Peninsula. And also you can have envelope curves that's developed based on hydrological boundaries such as river basins. That's the one that you see on the bottom. And definitely we can upsize that um, to a global extent to look at the whole envelope curve. Um, I believe the very first one was was created in 1967. And since then, as we get more and more data, uh, as we experience globally more maximum extreme flood events, um, the envelope curves got updated. These two figures here show the more recent one by Hershey in 2002 and um, Lee et al. in 2013. Now, let's have a quick look at um, how they compare, how different envelope curves compare in different parts of the world um, and comparing it against the wall envelope curve. If we were to just look at uh, a discharge a catchment area for, for 1,000 square kilometers, uh, we see the wall envelope curve giving us an uh, estimated discharge of 16,000 QMAX. It gets a bit smaller if we are just looking at the China wall envelope curve. Here in Australia, we are about two third um, that at close to 10,000 QMAX compared to the wall envelope curve. Yeah, so that's a quick overview of what envelope curve or flood envelope curve is uh, for those who are not familiar with them. Now let's have a look at how they sit with relation to the PMF. Uh, this is an example from the States. Uh, on your left is the United States envelope curve developed by Costa back in 80, 1987. And the table on your right shows uh, various location in the US where the comparison is done based on the peak discharge that has been extracted from the, the United States envelope curve and comparing it with the estimated PMF. Okay, so the estimated PMF is, uh, they are the numbers in red and the estimated peak discharge from the envelope curve are those in blue. So you can see here that um, as you might expect that the PMF are uh, significantly higher than the estimated discharge from the uh, envelope curve. Okay, that's uh, a quick run through of envelope curve. I'm just going to put that aside for now and uh, quickly jump into paleo flood records. Um, 
we did a webinar under geomorphology 101 with Australian Water School. So I won't dwell too much into payload floods here. If you're interested to find out more, um, jump into the AWS website or, and, or their YouTube channel. You should be able to get a, a video recording of that. Uh, but just, just briefly, um, payload floods are essentially essential floods that uh, occur prior to historical or systematic observation. So we have seen the flood envelope curves are developed using systematic observation or gauge records. Payload floods are essentially floods that occurred prior to such observation. Uh, they are derived typically using sediment as um, evidence of floods. And uh, two things that is uh, critical to any payload flood analysis or payload flood studies is to derive uh, when it happened and how big was that payload flood event. Let's look at how payload floods compare with, with some of the, the envelope curves. This is an example from uh, Northeast Spain. As you can see, the solid uh, black line is uh, the regional envelope curve for Northeast Spain, and it, it envelopes all the gauge records in that region. The dashed line is the world envelope curve, and the solid black triangles are uh, payload flood records from Northeast Spain. Here we can see that most of the, the payload flood records are sitting quite tightly with um, the regional envelope curve, and it's with a couple of them actually larger than uh, or outside uh, the envelope curve, but they are all still within the world envelope curve. Another example, this is from Australia. Um, examples of payload flood records from Australia. Uh, this is data from back in 2015 or 14. So um, we have substantially more records now. But again, most of the records are sitting pretty tightly with, with the, the regional envelope curves. Then what about payload flood in relation to the PMF? This is um, some examples from the United States and Spain, I believe in Europe. Um, so you can see again in the blue column, the maximum discharge associated with the payload flood records in these locations, they are um, significantly lower than uh, the estimated PMF for these respective regions. Okay, so again, not surprising to see PMF values are, are higher than payload floods or envelope curves. Um, another example, well, increasingly, payload flood records around the world have been used um, together with um, systematic records or gauge records for flood frequency analysis to improve um, the data set for extreme flood events. So this is an example where um, the gauge record uh, FFA for the one in 10,000 year event uh, gives a discharge estimate or flood quantile estimate of about 3,100 QMAX. When payload flood records are added to the gauge record for the flood frequency analysis, um, the estimated flood quantile for the one in 10,000 year event has um, been revised to about 3,500 QMAX. However, all these values are still significantly lower than the, the PMF estimates for this particular dam, which is estimated at over 10,000 QMAX. Okay, so another example showing where um, payload flood or systematic observation sits uh, compared to the PMF. So back to the first question, the question right at the start of the very first slide, uh, envelope curves or payload flood records close to the PMF. Uh, based on a few examples that I've shown, I guess the answer seems to be no. Um, however, a recent paper, well, not recent, a paper that we, we published last year, um, a paleohydrology study in the East Alligator River um, that is in Northern Territory, Australia, as you can see on the map here, uh, the paleo flood sites are in red. So what we found, the paleo flood records in the East Alligator River had a specific instantaneous peak discharge value of 25.4 plus minus three. And that seems to be very close um, to the PMF estimate uh, in the Nagala Creek. The PMF estimate was derived from one of the Ranger Mine study. Um, yeah, so that this paper actually provided a few reasons and uh, Rory in his previous uh, talk also gave some examples of, of reasons why the PMF could be um, seen or experienced. Uh, I guess to answer the question, can, can payload flood records and envelope curves uh, be close to the PMF? This is um, an example where it has or can be. And um, I just want to 
end the slides by just noting the notion that uh, we have been looking everything today, just looking at rainfall and runoff floods, but there are other um, types of triggers that can cause floods, which uh, can be significantly larger than some of the rainfall runoff floods. And that's it. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Daryl, for that. I want to also cover a couple of items about uh, design uh, events and should we be designing for the PMF. So we set out to answer a few questions about the underlying science behind PMP and PMF estimates. And I think uh, Rory and Daryl did an excellent job striking the balance between taking some very technical statistical uh, concepts and putting it in a way that's uh, understandable for all background levels. Um, now, what I wanna do here, I'll put on my engineering hat and pose that question again, um, should we be designing our infrastructure for the PMF? I'll use a couple of examples from Australia, um, but before we bring it back home to Australia, I did wanna highlight uh, one of the floods that was recently in the news. Uh, you may have seen some of the frightening footage of flooded subway cars in China back in July. Um, and well, you can see a map here of the area and some of the news articles that cite the rainfall depths over a range of time frames. So we had uh, 640 mils uh, that fell in three days, so 72 hours. We had 552 mils um, in a one day period, 24 hours. And then we had 202 mils uh, in one hour. Uh, that is a lot of rain uh, for the uh, Americans watching here. That is uh, eight inches in one hour. Now, incidentally, right along here is uh, where there was a series of 62 cascading dam failures that resulted in 100,000 fatalities back in the 70s. Uh, if you want to start talking about floods that exceed the PMF, um, that's one with a lot of lessons to learn from. Um, but back to 200 mils in an hour, um, how bad is that? If we have a look, there's a website here. Um, I'll just pull it up live um, so you can see it on the Bureau of Meteorology's uh, webpage that shows you Australia's record rainfalls and um, highlights that uh, against global events. So you can see how it compares in, in each state and uh, what those uh, rainfall rates have been. Here it is plotted out. And so where does that 202 mils in one hour fall? Um, we've got 202 mils right there in one hour. Um, then this is the 24 hour and the 72 hour. Uh, if you look in all of Australia, most states have never touched 202 mils in an hour. One time, I think maybe two or three events, but uh, I think up in Queensland, one time there was one event that exceeded that. So in all of recorded rainfall history in uh, Australia, um, you know, this is near the very top. So um, should we uh, be designing for that? And again, uh, you know, how, how bad is 200 mils an hour? Uh, or that that's something that, uh, you know, if you had a quick response time and in a catchment like uh, for the subways that got flooded, um, that may be a worst case, you know, approaching a PMF uh, event. Um, but uh, yeah, what we've seen here, um, spillways are typically designed for uh, uh, for PMF events because of the consequences, uh, but you don't have to overtop them. Uh, you don't over have to overtop a dam or a levee to, uh, to fail it. This one is an example with huge environmental consequences in Australia that didn't get overtopped. Um, it's, uh, it failed in other mechanisms uh, or went through other mechanisms. You can see here, uh, these could be dams or levees, but if you were protecting against overtopping for you know, what we just talked about with uh, Rory and Daryl, you know, a one in 10 million or a one in uh, a million AEP event, uh, you've protected against that. These other mechanisms um, may be occurring much more frequently and we may need to look at those as well. Um, so in Australia, we have uh, a large mining industry and we have a lot of creeks going alongside them. Uh, what happens when you get these diversions and when you have creek capture, um, how big of an event should you be designing for to keep the creek out of the mining pit? Well, the consequences can be very catastrophic. Um, these images come from a paper that I'll give you some links to uh, later on. Um, if you're looking into the page, uh, the flow is going into the page here and you have a mining pit uh, next to you. If you are uh, exceeding some crest elevation here, you can very quickly start eroding back and capture the entire creek, which if you look in the long section view here with flow going left to right, um, can start eroding um, and capture your entire bed load and all of your environmental water, um, sometimes for uh, hundreds of years uh, for the sediment load that you're looking at. So we do need to look at these consequences. And so if they're catastrophic, a lot of times we'll look at it and say, oh, okay, well, let's just design it for the PMF. Let's go up an extra meter. Um, but that might not be your failure mechanism. 
You might not have uh, an overtopping at all. You might need to beef this up somewhat. Uh, and sometimes um, you might need to look at something that's a, a, a geological scale. So in Australia, we're frequently asked to propose closure plans that we can walk away from and leave maintenance free in perpetuity. That's not really realistic if there's a hydraulic structure involved um, because any hydraulic structure will have a limited design life unless you make it so big that it becomes part of the geology. So essentially it's a landform then yeah, maybe it is permanent. Um, there is a misunderstanding about ARIs and AEPs that has led to some revisions in the naming conventions. Um, design life and recurrence intervals are not always uh, interrelated. Uh, a structure that's designed to withstand a hundred year event, it may give the impression that it's gonna last a hundred years. Um, or if you had a thousand year design uh, that it would last for a thousand years and then, oh, I'm designing for the PMF, therefore it's gonna last well forever. Uh, but that's not uh, not gonna be the case if you have uh, other events, uh, you know, some of these smaller events that test your structure more frequently. This chart shows, you know, a coin toss uh, if you flipped a coin twice, what are the chances that it would come up heads at least once? Um, and as you get around, you know, a five-sided die five times, a 10-sided die 10 times, a hundred-sided die, what are the chances that a given side would pop up once at least in a hundred rolls? Um, what happens then as you come up here and get this probability uh, is that over time on a time scale, you can very quickly uh, get to near certainty that a lesser event is going to happen during that time frame. So in our case, we're showing the 100 year in 500 years. So if these events test your system, then you might need to model some of that. Now we typically accompany PMF designs and things like that with a 1D or 2D hydraulic model, maybe a 3D CFD model. But if we're looking at scales like for uh, mine closure of 10,000 years or more, um, we'd have to look at something else. Um, you could potentially do sediment transport. We've done some runs up to periods of 10,000 years for that. Um, look at creep capture and the potential there and whether it's worth going to a PMF design or something in this case. Um, but when you're looking at 3D CFD models, some of them run in less than real time. And if you wanted to go 10,000 years um, and you're running at uh, one to 10 uh, time factor, um, you might be waiting uh, with 100,000 years of computer runtime before you have results. So we need to be pragmatic about it. Um, but I guess the main point of this, um, again, we can refer to some other pa papers uh, with more detail on this, is that just designing for a PMF may not be enough. Even if you did need to design a structure for a PMF, this example from Oroville shows us what uh, can potentially go wrong if you decided to walk away from a structure and leave it in place and you weren't watching to see what was happening, um, you know, you could very quickly get this head cut coming up here and launching you out into uh, a damn failure scenario that could be hugely catastrophic. Um, so it is something that even if the structure held up to a PMF design, doesn't mean that it's going to hold up in perpetuity unless you're watching it. Uh, and, and then you could potentially, if you're not watching it, run into consequences like this or uh, like this one here. It did not take a PMP event to cause this flood that rivaled or exceeded uh, the PMF. So so be very careful in uh, how we approach these things. It's something that uh, does need a little uh, more scrutiny, I think, um, instead of just walking away and saying, well, I put a PMF design on it, therefore it's going to last forever. So um, with that, I just wanted to also highlight um, a website here that I mentioned in the beginning um, that we've put some resources uh, up for you. I'll just pull this up here and just walk you through what we've got online um, for more information. Uh, I will post the recording here as well on this uh, website or a link to the recording um, and to the course that's coming up on extreme events. And you can get a free overview of that course. Um, uh, it covers book one, but also covers an overview of course six. I've timestamped that here so that you can see the overview of what you'll get in that course. We have uh, an expert panel of CSIRO scientists and others uh, talking about uh, climate change impacts on extreme event hydrology, which is very relevant to what we've talked about today. We also have Daryl Lamb's presentation on paleo flood hydrology and some of these geological scale events uh, and also some GLOF events and a landslide dam failures and things that resulted in floods that uh, sometimes by an order of magnitude exceed a PMF estimate because of the nature of what's going on. Um, we've got links to the ARNR manual. Um, this is also the website here that I've just referred to with the record rainfalls worldwide and in Australia. And then these are not all of Rory's publications, but the ones that are most relevant 
relevant for today and Daryl's presentations as, and uh, papers as well, along with the papers that uh, I've just referenced about uh, mine closure designs, hydrologic design criteria, uh, event-based versus duration-based assessments, and uh, you know what some particular uh, considerations uh, might be for addressing those in the uh, current uh, industry at the moment in Australia. Uh, I'll also reference these, I think um, Daryl uh, mentioned a few of these as well, the USGS publications on the world's largest floods, and these are some uh, resources that are available uh, for everybody, and you'll get those uh, as part of the YouTube uh, description as well so that you can link to it. So with that, um, we'll turn it over to some questions. Ben, thanks for answering some of the ones that you've done in the background. Um, if you wanted to come on, feel free. But uh, what we'll do is turn it back over to Rory first and then to Daryl. Um, maybe just uh, highlight a couple of questions that you've answered on the chat line. Um, in particular, let's focus on the ones that got upvoted the most because we may not have time to get to all of them. Over to you, Rory. Um, well, I've been furiously typing, so unfortunately, <laughs> I didn't get to hear anything that uh, Daryl and you said, Cray. All good. Been, uh, I feel like it's a, like a... Um, it's a pressure test. One of the questions here has been around this sort of engineering approach, and, and the engineering approach does seem to vary both with jurisdiction, with agency, and with context. It's like the standard project flood, et cetera. So in, in essence, there's a generally a big difference around the world with uh, treating PMS as a design standard. You've got to hit that standard. Once you've hit that standard, you're safe. If you don't, if you're just below it, you're not safe. I think that is quite problematic um, to take that uh, take that approach um, because of the fact that these estimates vary over time, um, and so it is much better to think in terms of risk or risk informed manner, uh, whereby you're actually calculating what is the risks of exceedance and what's your tolerability of risks, and matching that down down to the um, the risks of um, consequences of failure. So I think that kind of risk-informed approach does resolve a lot of the difficulties that we're, that we're seeing uh, or that commonly come up when people think about PMS. Yeah, thanks. Um, Daryl, do you want to um, just grab a, a question or two that um, came out near the top and then we'll open it back up again? Yeah, I was halfway typing through one of, that, uh, one of the questions. I might just go through that. I think it was a question by Timothy um, asking if the Australian values... Um, in terms of rainfall or flooding, lower than global values because of a smaller data set or regional differences or both? Um, yes, I would think both and more. Um, indeed, the Australian data set is, is definitely much shorter than some other places, whether it's in UK, in, in Europe or in North America. Uh, but regional differences is, is one of the main factors or the, the hydroclimatic uh, meteorological limits, is, it varies. I think there is a, the, a plot in... Um, a USGS report in 2004 that talks about uh, some of the larger floods that uh, that I really like. It shows the difference in the maximum observed flood across different latitudes. So yeah, regional difference is definitely another re uh, factor that that can affect why or explain why the Australian values are, are lower than the global values. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. And I think what we'll do is just, you know, again, if, if it's just kind of a free for all to pick and choose which ones uh, we're, we're going to be able to hit, because it looks like there are so many questions, or at least 20 questions that we've seen here so far that we probably won't be able to hit them all. Um, but there are a few uh, unanswered ones here as well. Uh, ben has come on. Uh, ben, uh, you thanks, thanks so much for your help with this one. Um, if you can, please, uh, yeah, just l let us know uh, maybe the ones that, you, that you've hit that have the most upvotes at the moment. No worries. I'll turn my camera back off in a second to um, spare you from the terrible beard and the terrible internet um, broadband speed. But um, there's an interesting question from from Greg. It was talking more. He was talking about sort of dam failure scenarios and, and population at risk. But the, I think the the crux of the question was really around uh, how to treat joint probability in um, PMFs. And I was wondering if, uh, if if Rory might want to delve into that a little bit more. Uh yeah. So this is a big topic: joint probabilities. Um, Australian rainfall runoff. Thanks, Ben, um, does provide some work examples and techniques to deal with joint probabilities. I think um, one of the key challenges when considering joint probabilities with PMS kind of events is where do we get our understanding around the correlation structures that, 
that apply uh, to this. Um, and uh, I think the best way of dealing with it is to, um, you have to explore um, the different dependencies over a range of possibilities to kind of bracket um, how those joint probabilities may influence the outcome. Um, so we've generally got a lot of information to use on to inform joint probability assessments. When we get more extreme, we've got to be a little bit more thoughtful and explore uh, the, the deeper uncertainty that's associated with it. Yeah, uh, thanks. And I think um, one question that came up that kind of summarizes a, a few of these, um, you know, what, uh, what type of structure would need to be designed for a PMF? So that question has come up. And, and that's really a, a, a pretty loaded question because really anything... Uh, now that I've seen some of the footage um, uh, of a subway, if you're designing a subway entrance, and I've got this phobia of drowning from a childhood experience at one point, when I've seen people in a subway um, with it flooding and filling up, that freaks me out. And if I'm a designer for a flood, you know, for a, for a subway, I'm starting to think, wait a second, um, especially with climate change coming up and extreme events going up. Uh, you know, maybe that's not one of these critical infrastructure things like a nuclear facility or a tailings dam or something like that. But wow, you know, should we be considering something a little more extreme than what we've been designing for in the past? Because, you know, your, your catchment, you know, that's never happened before in that area. And so the designers thought, okay, well, we don't need to design for it. But looking at the consequences, and I guess that's the answer here, is you look at the consequences and weigh those out and try and decide how much money do you have. And unfortunately, what happens is in some areas where there is not enough money and there aren't the safety regulations, um, sometimes things with very high consequence don't get designed up to par when they should be. Over to you, Nate. Rory. Yeah, look, I'll, look, I'll make the point. Uh, there is actually a lot of literature um, so in the UK, Australia, and, and the US around um, appropriate levels of risk associated with different threats of uh, uh, loss of life. Um, if, if you've got a structure, and I think that's a really, really good example that I think has been not well considered, uh, and, you know, Melbourne's building its uh, underground um, metro now or expanding it, um, I think the design that goes into those portal structures needs to give a lot of care to um, the potential loss of life. Now, the relationship between uh, appropriate design uh, uh, tolerable risks and uh, potential loss of, of, of life, um, there's a lot of literature on that. Uh, it's not easy navigating your way through it, um, but it is really important. And I, the, the, the thing we need to keep in mind is whether you, you lose your life from falling out of an aeroplane or the aeroplane falling out of the sky a nuclear power plant uh, melting down uh, or a flood wave coming down for a subway, um, it's the threat to life that's an issue um, and it's, a, it's, it's the onus is on us to make sure uh, that those risks are, are as low as reasonably practical. Yeah, thanks. And, and I think even if you're not asked to design for it, just as a conscientious engineer, you may want to just throw it into your model, whether you present it or not, and just just weigh it out yourself. You know, put, even if you haven't been asked to look at the PMF, you may want to or, you know, and, and, or put PMP precipitation on your rain on grid model, for example. You may want to do it. It's just an extra run. And then it, you may identify some things that you would want to raise um, as, as concerns. Um, so you know, that, that's, that's a, a question that I, I think we all need to uh, answer individually um, and then Collectively, there needs to be some some guidance, obviously, on that. Um, Daryl, any other questions that you've hit that you wanted to focus on? Yeah, there's a question from Ellen Herring, BCC, I assume, Brisbane City Council. Uh, when using payload flight estimates, how can we take into account the fact that the climate over the last ten thousand years has not been stationary? Um, yes, that's that's a that's a very good question. Um, we we also need to consider the fact that. Uh, Climate has not been stationary in the last 10,000 years, but also the fact that um, climate is not going to be stationary for the next 10,000 years. So um, I think in terms of paleo flood estimates or a lot of the application of paleo flood records, um, personally, I try to limit um, going too far back in time in terms of the records that I would use in terms of its application. So at least we, we try to um, narrow that uh, variability in the climate. Uh, that might have an impact on the records. Yeah, so that, that's it's something that we have um, to deal with uh, in terms of that um, non-stationarity. Thanks. Um, and if you go back and watch that webinar about um, the climate change impacts on extreme event hydrology, uh, we did have the Bureau of Meteorology coming on as well. And uh, just mentioning that for the PMF right now at the moment, um, 
it doesn't get adjusted for climate change. I think as we've kind of mentioned today as well, but uh, you know, it's, it's something, it's probably because there just isn't enough data to be able to show, um, you know, how, how you, how you would adjust that, but everybody knows it's going, you know, things are going to change as far as how it's going to change. Um, that might be, you know, a, a, a bit of an un uncertainty at the moment. Um, any other comments on that one, Roy, because climate change has come up a, a few times on these questions. Uh, yeah, look, it's fair to say to our, we've done a bit of a literature review on this and we haven't found a single agency around the world um, who's uh, revised their operational estimates of the PMP, um, but you can pretty easily find uh, a, a research papers that claim that it's necessary. Um, from now, I, I think the answers, because of the methods often uh, used to derive PMPs involve certain caps on the way they maximise things, um, it's actually, I don't think there's probably as quite as direct an influence of moisture availability, uh, increased moisture availability um, in the atmosphere and PMP estimates because of the, the various constraints and assumptions put into the PMP methods. Um, but it is something that is, is an, uh, an active uh, uh, an act research topic. And um, uh, Shish Sharma, Kongan Brasco and myself have a PhD student, uh, Johan Visser, looking at this uh, topic at the moment. But I think it's probably a, it's, a, it's an active research topic. Yes. And as you can see, um, thanks for all the attendees. We're about on the hour mark here. And so we'll be wrapping it up shortly. But, uh, you know, thanks to everybody who has attended this live and to those watching this um, down the road on the recording. Um, and thanks for those questions. As you can see, it's it's a it's a very uh, heavy topic. Um, you know, when we're talking about extreme potential for loss of life, um, you know, this is something that we do need to take seriously. And we need to make sure that we've done our homework and getting these messages out to the industry with the uh, best industry experts that we can find, um, who we've uh, hopefully brought to you today, and um, and 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 we do certainly appreciate their time um, that they've uh, uh, offered to come on board with us. But um, you know these things are out there for us all to learn from and to expand our knowledge. Now on that topic, um, those in Australia who are interested in uh, the. AR and R methods and uh, looking at extreme events in Australia uh, may wish to sign up for the AR and R course number six. Um, I believe the live course is full, but you can sign up for it on demand. That's coming up next month. Uh, Rory will be leading that. Um, and that's definitely a treat for all able to attend that one. For anybody outside of Australia, if you are interested in more of these topics, um, you know, or, or doing a workshop, um, a, a course uh, in developing PMPs and PMFs and uh, trying to get uh, th those estimates uh, nailed down and uh, getting comfortable with that, please respond in the survey uh, at the end, uh, before you leave and let us know, would you be interested in a course on this? Um, would you want uh, more dedicated webinars? Um, give us your feedback. Which subtopics of all the ones we've covered today would you want to see a dedicated webinar on? So we do look forward to your, um, your feedback. So I think uh, what we'll do is uh, turn it over for closing remarks. Um, first to Daryl. Ben, if you'd like to make some closing remarks, uh, feel free to turn your uh, camera on when, uh, when, when, when Daryl's done. Uh, so Daryl, over to you, and then we'll have uh, Rory close it in the end. Yeah, um, don't think we managed to answer all the questions, <laughs> but if, if anybody um, that have some questions, uh, feel free to just drop me an email. I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks. Yeah. We'll turn it over to uh, Rory to close up. Oh, look, I've... I've really enjoyed uh, seeing the questions that are coming up. Um, I think there's some really, uh, really a great range of questions. I don't think any of these questions have easy answers, but I uh, really, really appreciate uh, the attention and, and the, um, uh, that, you, that you're giving the topic and, and the questions you're asking. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. So for um, if for additional resources, go to that uh, website, surfacewater.biz slash PMF. You'll see all the papers there that you, you'll have hours and hours of reading time. Um, and again, for those who had to leave early or if, uh, if you want to go back and watch any of these parts again, you will receive a recording link. So thanks so much for attending. Do fill out your one minute survey. Got a lot of exciting topics coming up for the water sector, new technologies um, for water modeling. And uh, we've got pumps hydro coming up and some additional two flow um, uh, webinars that are coming up as well. So sign up for those, sign up for the courses and uh, let's keep expanding and increasing the knowledge of water modeling in the industry. So thanks so much for attending. Thanks to our presenters and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Subscribe by clicking the link below. 
and click on the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases. For the latest in significant, innovative and critical advances in water science, technology and management, subscribe now to build your skills, enhance your technical knowledge and learn from leading experts in water, visit the australianwaterschool.com.au and discover our online training courses, both live and on demand.